Um, my name is Rachel Ayo. I'm one of the associate deans for grade 10. And it's nice to see some of you back for another PTO meeting. We're really excited to have today the curriculum coordinators and uh, some of the program advisors here to talk to you, as well as the head of guidance, to talk to you about the choices for your rising juniors for next year. Junior year is a very important year. It's an exciting year. Your, your children get to make a lot more choices about their education and things that really interest them expand outside of the realm of the typical um, required courses. And I would say, you know, Brookline High School has an incredible array of course options for students. It's more like a college campus than it is a high school. So I really encourage you to work with your child to think about, you know, choosing something maybe a little bit outside the box, sort of thinking about some things that really expand their current experiences, um, and also trying to find ways to create balance between, you know, maybe some honors, maybe an AP class, um, and uh, other classes that help create a good uh, school balance with their, uh, their um, outside experiences if they're doing something like uh, sports or extracurricular activities. Those take up a lot of time as well. And so finding the right balance between schoolwork and things outside of school is really important for your child's mental and physical health. Um, and it's something that we're really careful about uh, in building schedules for students, uh, particularly for junior year. So please work with your um, child's guidance counselor and have your child work with their guidance counselor on creating a schedule that will work best for your child uh, to really create that best uh, work-life balance, something we all try and achieve, right? So I'm gonna turn over the presentation today to the after the prom party parents. They're gonna talk to you about the after the prom party first. Um, this is something your children will experience in just two years, not too long from now, and benefit from it. So they would definitely appreciate your help and support in their presentation and their um, work. And then we'll have a, um, some of the uh, program advisors and um, curriculum coordinators come and talk to you about the different course options you have uh, for your child for junior year. And then uh, the head of guidance will come and speak with you. Dean Redding uh, and Dean Alexander will also be here and will be around until about 9.30 to answer any questions that you may have. Hi everyone, um, I am a, uh, a senior parent um, and I this is my third year running the After the Prom Party. Um, I got involved my freshman year and it is a fantastic way um, to get involved in the school with the parents and be parents in all four years. This is our 28th year doing the After the Prom Party and what we do is we bus the kids to the prom and back and then they go to the tap and gym, which is completely transformed into a nightclub that they will never experience again. It's three floors, it's a different theme every year. This year our theme is Throwback Tuesday, um, so it's all the decades, and it really takes three days um, during Memorial Day weekend, Sunday, Monday, Tuesday, and the promised Tuesday to transform that gym, and then we bring it all back into storage and everything else, Wednesday morning, 5 to 8 a.m. So it is a fun event to get involved in any way. We are having our kickoff meeting on March 5th for volunteers to see how you can participate and get involved. It's a great way to pay it forward as sophomores and see what's ahead. Meet uh, junior and senior parents that you can learn about the college process and just gossip. And it's really fun to get involved. So think about it, get involved. There's lots of ways to participate for as little as two hours or as much as you want. So get involved. And this is Sharla, she's in your class. And she'll tell you why she's joining us. <laughs> so, so Julian asked me. Actually, I was having a conversation with a parent this weekend, and they said, oh, I haven't gotten involved with the high school because you have to be asked. I am asking you. <laughs> Here's your invitation. So um, yeah, I got involved last year. And what struck me the most, and what I hope will inspire you, is that um, other towns are shutting down their proms because it's such a high-risk night. And I don't want something to happen between here and my son's senior year so that he doesn't have that experience. Because it's one of the only experiences, I guess besides Powder Puff, yeah. where- And Junior Semi, there's three experiences. <laughs> that brings the whole class together. And I just, I want to do my part to keep our kids safe, our roads safe. <coughs> Um, on that night where they want to raise the ante and make memories. So, um, so they're gonna make please. memories and tap and have yeah. a blast. Yeah. And they don't want to leave, it's really fun. So get involved, it's Thanks. a great way. Good morning everybody. My name is Amy Beyer and I'm a program coordinator of the ACE program here at Brookline High School. We're a new program 
program. We started uh, three years ago. And we are an alternative program that exists within VHS for students who are looking for a different educational experience than a traditional one. And we are drawing students sort of for lots of different reasons. Some students who have been bored in traditional classes and want to go at a faster pace um, and want to feel like they have more control over their education. And we are drawing students who have not felt successful in traditional classes and have felt the need to experience their education in more of a hands-on, experiential way. So we offer two courses at a time, two academic courses at a time, for six weeks at a time. And students take 12 of these classes throughout the year. Um, so they do all of their primary academics through ACE. And then in addition to that, they have opportunities to do internships for credit in the community during school hours. And as far as I know, we're the only program in the high school that allows students to do that during school hours. Um, we also have dual enrollment arrangements with uh, Roxbury Community College, so students can take college courses for college credit and transfer, transfer those college credits when they apply to college. Um, we also do our own version of online classes, so we've taken our curriculum from our six-week classes and converted those into an online um, platform, so students who want to go faster through the curriculum can also do that. So we're, we're sort of a menu of different options for doing their academics, but we also place a huge emphasis on community. So it's a small program, there are 48 students in the program, and our focus is really to cultivate a strong sense of connection with students so that they learn how to trust each other, that they learn how to have a, a place where they can talk through issues that are going on in the world, or issues that are going on in the community, or even in their school. Um, so we have advisory twice a week, really to allow space for that. Um, and there's a huge emphasis on student leadership. So students can organize trips for the program. Um, there's a student leadership team that meets weekly, and they give feedback on the program. They also do a lot of public speaking about the program because it's fairly unique. It's a competency-based program, which means that students earn competencies rather than grades. And this is something that's happening across the country now. There's really a movement towards competency-based education because it really makes the learning more explicit rather than earning a grade, which can sometimes feel arbitrary to students. They're given rubrics for any major assessment and it spells out how they earn that level of competency. So the levels of competency include basic competence, competent and highly competent. And those transfer into grade letter grades when they go to college. So when their transcript is created for colleges, they get translated into A, B, and C. But students cannot earn less than basic competent. Because our belief is if, if they don't earn what is the equivalent of a C or a basic competent, then they don't know enough about the information and they shouldn't just move on. So nobody in our program gets a D or an E. They don't meet, reach a basic competence, they take it again. Uh, so that's the, the premise of it. It's, um, like I said, it's all explicitly laid out through rubrics. So students are never unsure of why they got what they got. It's clear from the rubrics how they earn those levels of competency. Uh, so it's pretty radically different from a, a traditional classroom environment, and yet, in, in terms of the curriculum itself, it's aligned with the Massachusetts state frameworks and the core curriculum. Um, our, what our teachers have done is they've taken that and they've pulled out themes that they think are really important for students to know and understand deeply. So the courses are only six weeks long, but they go in great depth for those six weeks. And the students feel like they emerge after the six weeks really understanding something well because they have to demonstrate that they know it. So we do a lot of performance-based assessments rather than tests, where students have to either teach what they know create something to demonstrate that they understand the knowledge, um, and that could include creating a podcast or writing a script um, or doing um, some kind of graphic visual of what they've learned. Uh, there's usually a menu that's offered to them from the teacher, and those are called performance-based assessments. So um, I would be very happy to answer a couple of quick questions, and then I'm also very willing to um, feel more longer conversations over the phone or over email. We're doing our big push right now for enrollment for next September. So the 
application deadline is March 2nd. It's coming up fairly quickly after the vacation week. We're doing a lot of outreach in the school right now to <coughs> students. And our process is that we ask students to come and meet with our guidance counselor to do a one-on-one -on -one conversation to try to understand the program a little bit more. And then come sit in on a class so students can see it and feel it and experience it to know if they really could imagine themselves doing this. And then finally they come and do an intake meeting with me and their parents. They write a little statement about why they think it's a good match for them. So we're not academically selective. What, we're, what I'm looking for as a program coordinator is students who really want to be there because then it will work if they're motivated and they're inspired to, to do their education in this way. Um, so we have a lot of students right now who have applied for competitive colleges. That's often a question that I get um, because it's a different kind of program. Does it hurt their chances of getting into a competitive college? And from what we are seeing so far, it is not. In fact, there's a consortium of colleges that really um, deeply respect competency-based education and think that it's excellent preparation for what our 21st century world is these days. We do a lot of work on soft skills in our program where we talk to students about habits of success that we think are essential for their success in the work world. Everything from learning how to cooperate and collaborate to goal setting uh, to thinking about how to persevere if something's difficult or challenging, um, self-discipline, knowing how to sort of budget their time and think very concretely about how to plan backwards from a deadline. So those are skills that a lot of schools just think students are going to pick up magically along the way, and our feeling is let's not leave it up to chance. We want to explicitly address that through the curriculum, and we hold our students accountable to those skills during their exhibitions. And we have those three times a year where we invite parents to come in and the student runs an exhibition where they show their work and they speak to those habits of success that they're developing. So I'll take a few quick questions and then um, again, I'm, I've got a couple of flyers up here, so feel free to grab these on your way out today. One is really for students as a reminder of the process and the other one is more in depth about how our program works. Yes, yeah, apologies for being late. Can you just say what the program is and what your name is and where we can get more information? Sure. Um, it's Alternative Choices in Education. It's called ACE. And my name's Amy Beyer, and I'm the program coordinator. There are flyers right up here. Um, if you're interested, this right. is the time right now to get in touch right. before the deadline. Yeah. yeah. So are classes they are not. Um, what we do is when students come into the program during the first six weeks that they're in the program, they take a course called seminar. And during that time, we give them diagnostics and we assess what they, where they are at with their skills and their content. And what we find is that some students, regardless of their age, are more advanced in certain ways. And in some ways, they're not. And so we place them accordingly in their classes. So our classes are all mixed based on age and grade level. So they progress where they should be in the classes. So all of our classes are mixed. And we don't believe in doing honors in AP because our feeling is our courses are very rigorous and we want students to be on an equal playing field based on where they're at with their skill level and not to be comparing themselves to other students. We want them to know that they're in the right spot based on the diagnostics and then they need to be challenged accordingly. If they want to get credit for college, we really encourage them to do a college course at RCC because rather than replicating a college course, we encourage them to take an actual one and then transfer the credits. Yes. What, what student, what, what good student would be a bad fit for I think the only indicator that's a bad fit is if a student doesn't want to do it. <laughs> because Why would they all sound so good? Yeah. Well, I, mean, I think some students are really caught up with the honors AP and thinking that maybe it's going to hurt them somehow. Um, and, and what I say to students is, you know, colleges are looking for students who are doing interesting and unusual things and really taking a chance to explore something and learn in other ways. And I think the combination of doing something like an internship or taking an actual college class, um, in addition to being able to speak to things like the habits of success in a college interview, will really sort of distinguish them 
from an average applicant who may look the same as many, many others who've taken the AP and honors classes or have high SAT scores. I mean, those, those can be indistinguishable after a certain point for colleges. Um, what feedback we're hearing from colleges is that when our students go for their interviews, they know themselves really well because they've had to do these exhibitions three times a year. So by the time they get to a college interview, they're very articulate. They're able to talk about what their strengths are, what their passions are, what they're looking forward to learning more about. And they have already have a vision for where they want to go. So I think that that practice of learning how to do that is invaluable. I'm biased, of course. <laughs> yes. How are the electives dealt with? Can they take electives in the general from the general? Yes. So they take um, their electives, their PE classes, and their world language classes in the mainstream. And they take those during two blocks during the week. So we have two scheduled classes that are the same as mainstream. And are the teachers dedicated to ACE, yes. or are they? Okay. Yeah, we have four teachers, one for each subject area. So I should probably keep moving, because I know there are lots of people waiting to talk. Um, I would be very happy to talk more. So my contact information is on our website. This is a great information sheet that has a lot more detail. And this is a good one for your student if you want to encourage them to come meet with us before the deadline is over. Thank you. Uh, hello, my name is uh, Anya Salvor. I'm the Department Chief for World Languages, and I probably have uh, seen you before uh, as a parent of an eighth grader transitioning in ninth grade. Uh, I don't have a lot of new things to tell you, but I'll tell you the same things again. Um, so to graduate from World Language, from, uh, to graduate from the high school, you need two years of World Language in the same language. Uh, if you are an ELL student, some of those ELL credits can be used for more languages, so it's something to discuss with your guidance counselor. Now, many colleges either require or prefer that your child has at least three years of world language, so if for any reason uh, your child hasn't been yet enrolled uh, in, a, in a language, really, really, it's, uh, it's time to do this. Um, most students take a language for all four years, and we have five languages that we offer from beginning all the way through AP. So we have Chinese, uh, we teach Mandarin, so for five. Uh, we have Japanese, we have French, Spanish, and we have Latin. Um, so for most of your students, I imagine that they probably will continue from where they are to the next level and uh, have a conversation with their teacher as to what might be the best placement. We have a few students every year switch levels, and uh, if they're ready, we encourage them to do that. We have a World Language Support Center that's uh, open uh, four days uh, a week before or after school, so take advantage of that as well. And um, we have what we call an action plan where if someone is uh, ready and interested and motivated to switch levels, they go and visit a class of that similar level to get a sense of whether it's doable and then we give them some um, some information, some material to move forward. We have a few students who take two languages. It's not necessarily something that's going to work in their schedule. It gets very complicated, as you probably know by now. Uh, the days are pretty packed and seven blocks uh, are quickly filled. So, uh, but something to know in case your child um, has met or is meeting their elective requirements and passionate about language, uh, they may want to entertain the idea of having a, a second language. Um, some of your students have already um, some opportunities to learn a language outside the school and uh, maybe need a placement or maybe it's something that they speak at home or maybe they, were, they spend a good um, part of their life uh, abroad. Make sure to contact me through the guidance counselor and then uh, I have some placement um, test with them. The next one uh, is the Monday after the February break at 3 p.m. So let me know and uh, I'll add them to the list of, uh, of students who are coming from placement. Um, one question that I sometimes get asked is uh, do all of these languages offer experiences to travel abroad? And yes, they do. Uh, as you probably know by now, it varies depending on languages, 
Chinese as a bit of a special kind of program, which is a semester abroad for eight students. Uh, but typically, the other languages have a, about a two-week um, travel abroad experience. And we encourage um, anyone who is interested to apply. We have uh, financial aid. We're really committed to making it students. So if you have any questions, I'll take that now. Yes. No, that, that you can only get credit for taking one language at the at the high school. Uh, what happens is if a student takes a language outside, it's certainly something they can add to their transcript. You know, they just um, it's part of their package, so colleges will look at it favorably. Um, but in terms of getting high school credit. So, uh, so the person who coordinates the China exchange, his name is T. Lentos. Uh, students who go for a whole semester in China um, will continue to earn credits at the high school. They have a teacher from Brooklyn going with them. Um, it's been created in such a way that they can then get back into Brooklyn High with, with, without having lost any credit and having moved forward. All right. Oh, one more question. <coughs> Can one start a new language in um, 11th grade? For example, if someone like did Spanish in 9th and 10th, that he would meet the requirements for graduating from VHS, right? But if he has interest to start um, a new language, could he start a new language in junior year? Yeah, absolutely. You can start a new language as, as long as you have two years of the same language that you passed successfully at the high school. After that, it's up to you how you want to spend the rest of your time, either becoming more proficient in the same language or maybe trying something new and beginning when you're here. Mm -hmm. Thank you. OK. All right. Seriously, go take a, an advanced biology course, and they have chosen to go into biology fields and college uh, majors. Um, biology one honor is this one right here. Sorry, fast-paced, intense introductory biology course based around a lecture and discussion and of a wide range of topics. Um, generally speaking, we start with chemistry, go into biochemistry, and end the year in evolution. The, that's kind of the, the A through C um, bread and butter type of uh, biology course. Interactive biology is a discovery-based introductory biology course formerly known as BSCS Biology 100. It's abbreviated name, abbreviated name is iBio. The, the biology teachers came up with that. Um, and it really speaks to the fact that students work together more than the general lecture discussion format. So if students are more comfortable interacting with their peers, discussing things, getting up and making pre presentations, 
this might be a course that really speaks to the way that they learn biology or any science or really, you know, a lot of other topics as well. Obviously, biology is less mathematical than chemistry, so that's something also to consider in terms of which courses to choose from that way. Um, there is an option for students to take standard credit in iBio, but the best place to go for students who are thinking about um, uh, biology in, in general would be Biology 1, Biology 1 Honor, or Interactive Biology 1 Honor. Um, students do a lot of um, case studies, and they read articles, and then they respond to them as well in iBio. Another thing that we talked about a lot in this year are optional courses for juniors coming up. We changed the process a little bit this year, but many juniors at Brookline High School take an optional science course as well. So right, um, in a few minutes I'll be going up and teaching my astronomy class. Most of the students are seniors, but we found a space or two for a few juniors as well, and they really like that idea. So, and they're having a great time with it. The only problem is, when the seniors graduate, there'll be two kids left over. It's weird, but it works out really well. Um, we have a few juniors sprinkled out throughout some of the other courses as well, but by and large, we do have a lot of kids taking AP Chemistry as juniors. So the process will be, the students um, will hear about these courses in their chemistry classes. If they're interested in an additional a science course for junior year, they will have to go to their guidance counselor to pick up a form. And so this will be laid out. Um, I'm going to run this by, this is kind of a draft mode here. But student, let me see if I can make this decently large there. They need to figure out how that can fit into their 11th and 12th grade. Because some students, they want to get out of, uh, Michael Shipman's right here, they want to see if they can kind of get out of US history. Like, bad idea. No, you cannot take a summer course in something else to allow you to do this. You need to make sure that your elective credits are being met. You need to plan out the whole 12th grade to really figure out how you can fit that in because a lot of science courses, not just the APs, but um, our engineering, innovation, and design honor class requires six periods per week, and it's harder to schedule. The kids know what we're talking about. So, um, but so a student will hear the presentation from the teacher, They'll consider this, you have to figure out how it fits into your 11th and 12th grade, go to the guidance counselor for a consultation. This, the guidance counselor will sign the form and hand it to the student, and it's up to the student to take that to the teacher. And then, then it will happen that, from there. Um, so that's it in a nutshell. And I really encourage you to um, go and look for the letter that I had the first time. It will be up on the website, the Brooklyn High Science website. Um, this one right here, looks like that. A lot of detail about what we expect from students in terms of homework and preparation and some little ins and outs of it all. Um, and I do have a little blurb here about the SAT subject test. Uh, the SAT subject test, I will say, a lot, of, a lot of students have thought about this. Oh, when do I take this? Do I need to do this? I can honestly tell you that colleges do want you to take that. They don't. You need to figure out what your specialty is, whether it's German, US history, biology, biology M for molecular, biology E for ecology or environmental, um, and then really plan that out in, for your junior year. But they don't need to be worried about that right now. Um, the SAT subject tests are ranked near the bottom in terms of importance in college admissions. Yes, they want you to take them, they want you to have decent scores, but what they actually are and the best ones and trying to move those chess pieces around, um, they're, they're actually ranked very low. So don't use that as a criterion for which course to take. Try to figure out which one is the best for your child. So I guess I'll take a few questions. Yes? Do you have any experience, you have experience in, is um, Bio 1 honors or interactive biology 1 honors, are either of those a better combination with AP chemistry? No. No. But I will say that um, the way that the curriculum does work with iBio, um, a lot of students there um, think about the environment a bit more. Um, but AP Environmental Science um, has a few topics in it that you might actually be better off taking Bio 1 honor in. Um, and we're working on some of those kinks. But um, 
if they're going to take two sciences, um, most of the students do take biology one. Yeah. Yes, ma'am. Can you just touch on the um, AP chemistry exam? Should they be taking that this spring? AP chemistry, the AP so chemistry exam spring. happens after the AP chemistry course. Okay, so that would be the spring. If yes, spring. and if students are interested in the, um, the SAT subject test in chemistry, mm -hmm. then that says to me that they're really interested in chemistry, then maybe they should try to take AP chemistry. Okay. Yeah. But it's not the, it's not the be all and all. Yes? What are the optional science classes? Okay. One of the other ones that we have for um, juniors this year is actually AP Physics 1 and 2. We were able to get a, a few kids into that. And it all depends, let me see, sorry. Come on computer, I forget where I put this. It's right around here somewhere. Here we go. Hopefully we can zoom in on this. Can you see that? I'll make it, if I make it page width, I might. Okay, here we go. Students wouldn't be ready for a lot of these courses because some of them require some additional math courses. So AP Physics 1 and 2, AP Physics C, AP Chemistry, Anatomy and Physiology, Bio 2 Honor, AP Biology, AP Environmental Science, Environmental Science and Society at the honors level as well. Um, astronomy, Body Mind Honor, Engineering by Design, there's one missing here, Engineering Innovation and Design Honor. That was, um, we added that in this year. There's a new sequence for that. Marine biology and then some semester courses. Drawing for understanding and field science. Forensic science and genetics. <sighs> so, yeah, a bit to choose from. Yeah. And this will be actually, this is part of the form that students would get from their guidance company. Yeah. We have lab components in all of them. Uh, I'll, I'll say astronomy is a little bit more uh, simulation based, so the students learn things in different ways depending on the courses um, and marine biology often we have the kids uh, take a field trip to the aquarium um, and but yes anatomy and physiology the students dissected some interesting specimens the other day uh, for sure so yeah a lot of labs happen yes so I'm, I'm just a teeny bit confused like say my daughter is a freshman to engineering by design that's different course than yeah, there are two engineering courses. Um, and also, a lot of these, because they're biology based, you would need the biology course first. So you can't really take, you can't take anatomy and physiology as an optional junior. But that does apply to some students who have moved here from other places who might have had biology as ninth grade. So it's very complicated and it must be individualized. And I'm a little bit confused about the, sub, the SAT subject tests. Um, a friend of mine in Framingham, her son as a freshman took uh, biology as a freshman and then was required by his science counselors to immediately take the SAT subject test after he took his honors class. So how is that different? What should we be doing this year? When I saw this AP letter, I yeah. was like, oh, do I disregard this till next year or should we be signing? Okay, so I don't know if you heard that question, but in other schools where they do biology <laughs> first, a lot of schools do um, really encourage, maybe even strong arm the kids to take the SAT subject test. Um, there's all sorts of evidence to point to the fact that that's a terrible idea. <laughs> yeah, um, I can talk with you about that a little bit later. But yeah, it's, it, the SAT subject tests are meant for juniors to take once they really know what their best subjects are. What about SAT maybe some other schools, but we, so some of the kids, if, they're, if they like the idea of it, sure, but if you're really interested in chemistry, if that's the idea, then you should try to take an, an optional course in chemistry. Um, and so a lot of schools, in, in some of the top schools in the area, they have, the, at most, students can take four sciences. At Brookline High, there are so many ways to take optional courses as a senior, our whole senior program from um, world history and uh, you know performing arts there are so many ways for students to specialize that we say figure out what the students want to specialize in and then consider those types of tests thank you Mr. Weiser. you're welcome <laughs> there any other questions feel free to email me
Schiffman, head of the social studies department. I'm also representing Mary Birchall, who is head of the English department, and she sounds amphibious right now. It's <laughs> <laughs> going around, it's lodged in her throat. And we have some English teachers now she's covering for. So, let me do social studies first, because I have to make up less for that. Uh, <laughs> so, junior year, the social studies curriculum changes. Freshman year, we've offered two courses, ninth grade, pre-modern world history and world history honors. 10th grade, we offer modern, uh, modern world history uh, and modern world history honors. In 11th grade, we had AP US history. So your kids may be hearing, talking, consulting with their teachers and other students about that choice for next year. Uh, so let me say a couple of things about that, but let me also forecast, we have another new thing going on in junior year. It's very new. Uh, we had a pilot course this year called American Studies. It's a clustered course offered designed, built, uh, and now run by an English teacher and a social studies teacher, Mark Wheeler on the social studies side, Dave Fischel on the English side. And what that course does, it replicates a model that English has successfully introduced in sophomore year, some of your kids may be in this course, real world lit, or the other one is fake world lit. Um, <laughs> so uh, those are mixed level classes. They are uh, different format for studying English in 10th grade. In 11th grade, what our American Studies class does it focuses on narrative storytelling. The students tell their own stories, and then they learn about the stories Americans have told themselves about what it means to be American. And so far, we're off to a tremendous start in that class. So actually, let me, let me tell you about American Studies first and who I think it might be good for. Then I'll tell you about AP US History, tell you about some optional courses that I'll give anyway. So traditionally, we teach narrative history. We did it in pre-modern, we did it in modern world history. And if you take US History standard honors or AP, you'll do narrative history. You'll start at the beginning. You'll get to as far as we can get, hopefully, to the Trump election. Uh, so I started there just to be safe with my US honors class. American Studies is, as I said, a narrative course. By design, what students do in English builds on what they do in social studies and vice versa. The teachers collaborate all the time. They wrote the curriculum together. They began the year with what we call boot camp. They studied the broad scope of US history, that narrative thing, in a thematic way from beginning to end. And they finished that at the end of first quarter, and now they've done units on money, the stories people tell themselves about money and what it means. They read literature, they studied historical cases, they did in-depth character study, and they talked to their parents about money, and they talked to their friends about money, and they read stories about money. They're doing the um, uh, unit right now on migration and immigration. And again, they're using their historical background and knowledge. They're using a lot of personal experience. Uh, and what we can say early on is boot camp is working really hard. But the students really feel like they are now able to dig in. And I don't know if our, our generation might have been early on. Did anyone study, major in a studies field in college? A couple of studies people? So now it's very popular. American studies is hugely popular in American college. This course is meant to introduce students to that kind of work. It's a, uh, this year, we've offered that course for standard credit only. Uh, next year, we're going to offer it for either standard or honors credit. It'll work just like the sophomore English classes, mixed level. Students will be in the same room with the same teachers, with the same curriculum, doing the same kinds of work. However, the honors students will be expected to go in much greater depth with text, with writing, and uh, the conceptual demands of the course will be higher, but the community will be the same. Stop there. Questions about American studies. Go. Is it a credit for social studies or for English? You have to take both. Sorry, thank you. That you need to take American studies and English. You gotta do both. So, and, and this is the logic of, of coordination between the teachers. When they have a big paper in English, they will work on it in social studies, but they won't have a separate assignment. In order to make that work, we need all the students to have those two teachers. They're not all necessarily in the same section. We offer multiple sections. But everyone who has Wheeler has Mitchell and vice versa. So you have to sign up for both. So is that honors English? Or is it? You can take it for honors. You can take it for regular standard credit. And you can do it, if you're stronger in English than history, you can do honors English and standard history. Should you say one more thing about this? This year it's a pilot. Next year it's officially a pilot. It's part on the budget. <laughs> the better the budget, the more sections we can offer. If we don't have a terrific budget, which is possible, then we may be stuck with the pilot we have, which means if the course is popular among students, we may have to turn students away just because we don't have the sections. 
Yeah. And then how does this uh, American study uh, class differ from the regular US history? What's the difference? So what, what we do in a, in a condensed thematic way in the first quarter of American studies is in, in essence, I'm teaching uh, our mid-level US history course at US History Honors. We start, I did a little unit on 2016, and then I began with the roots of the American Revolution, and we will conclude at the end of the year in a broad, with our broad narrative, which will end with uh, reactions to globalization in American society. So it's, a, it's meant to give kids a, a picture of what it looks like to study American history from beginning to end. But it is a conventional narrative history course. This course is more like, in, in college studies classes, uh, much more study of culture and expression, how people interpret their experience, which of course we do to some extent in my class. Less emphasis on what actually happened and in what order, much more emphasis on what meaning did people make of the experiences they had, which is what allows us to do thematic units. The immigration unit is not a necessarily a sequential unit. The money unit is a thematic unit about what it means to have or not have money. So maybe this American uh, Studies class is also more designed here towards um, incorporating current events, mm -hmm. like if, you know, tons of contemporaries. Yeah. Tons. We do again. We do some in our in our conventional courses, and I'll tell you, part of the motivation for this came from the fact that in our standard level U.S. history courses, I think they were quite good, and they are quite good. They remain quite good, but there were students who were done with that. Yes, I know what you're going to do. You're going to start at the beginning, you're going to go to the end, and you're going to check to see what I know. And we thought that we could get better production from some of our students who were, they've had enough of that, and so far the wager is paying off. We have students, in fact, the introduction of the honors level is to account for the fact that we have some very talented kids in that class who have discovered they actually don't hate history or English. <laughs> they just needed to get it in a different way, and then, oh, well, oh, this is about money? I've got a ton to say. <laughs> No. I mean, it's not designed for that. The only course we offer, so let me segue, the only course we offer that prepares students to take the AP U.S. History class is the AP U.S. History class. <laughs> and so that class, I'll say this, uh, again, let me refer ominously to the budget. Our classes are very full right now. And so what we do, we say two things which are somewhat contradictory. We want students to push themselves. We absolutely do. And I assure you that I try to push all the students in my U.S. Honors class as hard as I can take their testimony but I believe they feel pushed. AP US history is a push for all of our students, except a handful who have extraordinary memories, work ethic galore, and so on. It's a very difficult course. It's by far the most difficult course my department has offered to your children. So on the one hand, I want to say try it. On the other hand, I want to say, if you sign up for AP US history and you're in that class and we get three weeks in or four weeks in and you're dying, I may not have a spot. Uh, and that has happened numerous times this year where students are really struggling. We can't find a spot in the U.S. History Honors class. And I'll tell you now, the philosophy there is it, it, may, feel, it may feel mean to the individual student, but I don't want your kids to be in classes of 30. And uh, I've seen school districts that have made a different wager on this, and they will allow classes to go to 30. It's very hard to get that back once you get it. And I would like none of our classes to be 30. And for kids who sign up for an honors class or a standard class, I want that class to be the size that we promise in advance. And so be cautious. If your kid loves history, if your kid has prodigious work habits and wants a challenge and is willing to accept the responsibility of taking it, definitely try it. If you're not sure, teachers are the experts, the 10th grade teachers know what they're facing. Okay, what did you just say the last part? And if you're not sure, not talk to your teachers. Okay, the teacher who's teaching you now knows what's coming. Got it, thank you. Get the recommendation. Get the recommendation. Yeah. So they take American, if the American Studies course. They take an American Studies English and an American Studies Social Studies. Both. Okay. That's what they're called. We have optional courses. I'll just mention Social Justice Leadership Workshop, Global Leadership, wonderful additional courses. They don't count for Social Studies credit. They are taught by Social Studies teachers and applications. Very simple applications. Really just expressions of interest are due on February 28th. I hope that word is widely out to students. We also have one term senior options courses. We allow juniors in on space available. Space has generally not been available in the fall, occasionally in the philosophy class, the one term class. Sometimes in the spring we have space in gender and society and Asian American studies for juniors who are interested in adding that, those classes to their schedules. 
English. English had three options in sophomore year. Standard, honors, and mixed level, real world, and future. 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 future world. Nothing. Well, future world, but they make things up in both classes, honestly. So um, the American Studies is a very nice option, I think, for English students who have been in those mixed level classes and been very satisfied with that experience. Uh, otherwise, English Standard and English Honors are very similar to freshman, sophomore. They are leveled conventional English classes. In addition, students may enroll in journalism. With an application. What else about English? <laughs> Melanie, what else about English? So, if my memory serves me correctly, um, the junior year uh, sort of standardized um, uh, course is called American Literature. <coughs> um, American Literature. Um, that's offered for standard and honor credit. Um, we don't generally, we don't actually at all offer an AP English class. Um, I cannot answer that question why. You'll have to talk to uh, the department head, Ms. Marginal, about that. Um, but there are options over the summer if kids want to really prepare for the AP English exam to do a summer course with some of our teachers. We increasingly students do that. They study, prepare, and take the AP English class. Question about it? Is journalism in addition to the other three, or? It's taught by an English teacher. It does not count for the required four years of English. Are there any other English options, you know, outside of them, besides journalism? Not for junior year. Okay, thank you. In senior year, we have a, just to bookmark, we have a wonderful course, course called Epic for students who have or want to have a passion project, and that will release them from the second half of their senior English class to pursue that passion. And, and we have wonderful results with that class. Those are the ones that are on the 28th. Racial awareness is a similar kind of course. It's taught by social studies teachers. doesn't count for the required social <coughs> studies credits. That was only open to sophomores. Right. But the, yeah, but the others are open to juniors and seniors. And uh, right, they are short applications. Uh, social justice, global leadership. Um, global leadership is four times a week. All the action happens in the class. Social justice is twice a week. Half the action happens outside the class. It involves an internship. Uh, I guess my question was, well, is that just open to one grade, or is it for the whole thing? Like, no, it's a multi-grade <laughs> class. <laughs> it, it runs like our elective classes, where you have kids of okay. students of various. Uh, so, so if you took it this year, you would, uh, it's just one year class, right? One shot. And so, so if you didn't take it this year, it's not like all oh, you know, couldn't take it. Next Absolutely year, it's just not. One year, so whatever take it, it is, senior. one year. Okay, thank you. Good luck. Mm -hmm. Good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is Kenny Kozal. I'm the Performing Arts Curriculum Coordinator. And um, the Performing Arts is a little bit different than some of the other subjects that you've heard about today in that um, almost all of our classes, really, really all of our classes have a mix of different grade levels. And, and most of those have a mix of different grade levels in, um, from freshmen through seniors. Uh, just to give you a little lay of the land about um, performing arts and electives in general at the high school, uh, all students at the high school, uh, in order to graduate, need to complete three full years of electives, or three full credits in electives, which is the equivalent of three full years. Um, you just heard about some elective options in science and in social studies and in English, however, those electives are not, they don't fulfill the elective graduation requirement. The elective graduation requirement um, is from three different departments. It's performing arts, visual arts, and career and tech education. Um, performing arts consists of three different disciplines. It's music, drama, and dance. And um, in order to fulfill the graduation requirement, students need to take at least one elective class in each of the three elective departments. So one, one class in either, one class in performing arts, visual arts, and career and tech ed. Unless they choose to do what's called a pathway, which is a pathway <coughs> where a student is really passionate about one of these areas and they decide, 
I want to do all of my elective credits in performing arts, or I want to do all of my elective credits in visual arts. Um, as your children are going into their jun junior year, most of them will still need to complete their graduation requirements. There are some students who can, can get uh, more of that done by junior year, but the majority will, will still have remaining elective requirements. And um, I, I think there's two things here that are important. There, there's fulfilling your requirements in order to graduate. And perhaps more importantly is that we are at this amazing high school where there are so many options that students can take these really wonderful classes in all of our elective departments. And it's really an opportunity both to <coughs> explore something that a student's already passionate about or to find a new passion. Um, it's also an opportunity to use a different side of your brain, um, or in the case of a dance class, your body. Uh, and so we really encourage students during the school day um, you know, st some students might opt for a study hall to have a little break in the day. Uh, we feel that in our elective classes, it's really, for many students, it's kind of, um, you know, it, it's a break from, from all the other things they're doing in the day. It's a different way of thinking, a different way of working with other people. In performing arts in particular, the focus in um, most of our classes is really working in ensemble with other people. So it's a really a chance to learn all these skills of working together with other people, solving problems, critical thinking, creative thinking. Um, most, of, the majority of our classes are open for uh, all students. We, we do have different levels in that, not in the sense of like an honor and a standard level, but we have different levels in that we have beginning dance, which naturally leads into intermediate dance, which naturally leads into advanced class. In, into advanced dance. Um, we also have options for students to advance place into a higher level class. So if a student hasn't taken beginning dance but maybe has done dance outside of school, we do have auditions where a student uh, who has prior experience can audition in to an upper level class. Um, the same is true with music where we have our Camerata Choir, which is an honor level choir. Um, students who haven't uh, taken the, the steps to get up there can, can audition in. All of our auditions, um, and we have, we have a number of auditions, and they all happen at the end of February or beginning of March, and there's a very easy way to find this information, which is uh, we have a wonderful performing arts PTO group. It is called FOPA, which stands for Friends of Performing Arts. So you can just go to Brookline FOPA, Brookline F-O-P-A, and all of our audition information is there. But again, the majority of our classes are open for students to, to just sign up. And I'd really encourage you to um, have your children really look through the course catalog and again, pursue something they're already passionate about or say, you know, let me, let me try something new. Maybe I've, you know, I've done a drama class before but I'm interested in this digital music class or I've done you know, um, you know, music but you know, maybe I wanna try a dance class. So there's, there's really wonderful offerings here. So, some questions, yes? I was just wondering if there are any AP level classes in performing arts. Because yeah. I saw, like, okay, yeah. camera art or AP music, yeah. but I don't understand. So, so there, we only have one uh, AP class in the performing arts department, which is AP music theory. It's uh, you really need to have a strong base of music theory to start the class. Um, it's it's a it's a class that leads into the AP exam. Uh, we have our students do tend to do very well on the AP exam after this class. It is a very rigorous class. So that would be for someone who has prior music experience. Yes? Is it too late to be on a pathway? Uh, well, I, let's see. I, I don't think so. I mean, I guess it, it, you'd have to see what this situation is. And, and also, uh, being on a pathway doesn't, let's say, okay, you've taken one visual arts class, but you've decided, I really want to do everything now in performing arts. Well, then you end up maybe graduating with uh, three and a half credits instead of three, which is fine. Student, okay. the, th the three credits isn't the limit. There are many, many students who take m many, you know, more classes than just the three credits. So, so I don't think it's too late. Yes. So is there an option between taking one in each of the section and taking three in one section? Like, can you just mix and match? Uh, well, it's again, it's either you need to take at least one class, which could be a, a half credit class, in each of the areas, right. or you really need to focus everything in one to do the pathway. But that said, you could do one credit in, in visual arts, one credit, or sorry, a half credit in visual arts, a half credit in career and tech ed, and then two credits in performing arts, if that's really more what your focus is. Okay. 
So it's actually pretty flexible to be here right now. Uh, it's pretty flexible, but you need to at least do one class in each of our de departments. And one final annoying question? If no, no questions are annoying. Bring so it on. So let's say you have, hypothetically, a kid whose greatest terror in the world is taking a performing arts class. Like you Great have question. to die and roll over and yes. die. But he doesn't want to do a pathway. What class do you recommend? You know how you have like... This is a great question. Like, it's not like annoying at all. Science it, it, for philosophy. I'm, I'm so glad you asked this question. So, there are kids who don't want to be... First of all, many of our classes are not performance. They won't have a performance. Some are. If you're, if you're in a year-long dance class, you will perform at progressions. If you are um, you know, in our concert band, you will perform at our winter concert and our spring concert. You're also... You know, if you're in our concert band, you're with 90 other kids on stage, so you're not like center stage in in the spotlight. That that said, we have a, a many classes for kids who are a little bit. You know, I don't want to do that. We have a piano class that's open for students who are um, who are either no experience or or, um, or very little experience on piano. We have a class called Backstage. Uh, power tools and special effects. That's for kids who want to study. Like they don't want to be in front of, uh, you know, on stage, but behind the stage, learning how to do set design and lighting design and set, uh, run sound. It's a really practical class. We end up hiring a lot of those kids to work events here, and then they can, you know, get get a, some job training. We have um, a digital music production class. That again, I said most of our classes are ensemble based. That's one where kids are really working more individually on a computer. Um, so there, there's a lot of options. I, I'd look through the course descriptions. Thank you so much. Yes. Thank you, Mr. Kozel. Great, thank you. Good morning, everyone. How are you? Breathe, breathe. I walked into the room and I felt I was like trying to get oxygen in. There's a lot of people holding their breath, it feels like. I'm Darby Neffier. I'm the coordinator of guidance and counseling here. And I just wanted to take a couple of minutes and insert myself um, as you hear about all of the great advice and ideas coming at you around course selection. Before I dive into some of my suggestions, I wanted to mention one very practical point. Um, you and your student will need access to the portal um, if you do not have that already. And we have been getting some different information from Town Hall about making sure that every student and parent has access to the portal. At this time, if you do not have access, um, you need to help with your password and um, the, the um, email that you would send um, and a help request to is datateam at psbma.org. Datateam, all one word, at psbma.org. Um, that access is critical around being able to see report cards, IPRs, attendance, but it's become even um, more critical around course selection because your student will be asked to go onto the portal to add electives um, in March, which is not very far away. Quick question. Do they get a separate access or do we give them our password? The student would have their own access. Um, so they can contact data team as well with your help. Um, another quick mention, um, many of you or a co-parent of your child should have received an email from me last night through Aspen. Um, that kind of gives an overview. I'm trying to really connect with parents around information coming from the guidance and counseling department. I'm hoping that's helpful for folks. Um, I did mention on that email AP registration. Um, there are a number of sophomores who take AP classes, but the majority of sophomores do not. So I do not want students and parents to feel like, wait a minute, why is AP up here? Um, because my child, I'm not taking APs. Um, I want to reassure you, if your student is not taking APs as a sophomore, they're completely on target and they're not missing out on anything. It was purely there so that students and parents of, of sophomores taking AP would be reminded to make sure that they register for those tests coming up. Oh, so that's that's right. That's for course. this year only. Yes, yes. You know, what down the there road, there should that happen, there, there will be other reminders in future yeah. years. Okay. Correct. Yes. You can't register this far in advance for AP. The so if you've taken an AP class, this year, this is for the test. Yeah, correct. Yeah. Correct. 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 We go to the test. I'll be honest. Yes. We were freaking out. Okay. Well, that's why I was, the moment was perfect for me to mention that because I got a couple emails back last night. Like I realized maybe that wasn't the best move on my part. So sorry about that. Um, what I am going to do while everybody's breathing easier, hopefully, um, is talk a little bit about that college word. Um, and this is really important. 
Um, based on our at Youth at Risk survey that happens every two years here, we have significant numbers of students in this building who are reporting that they're dealing with depression, anxiety, and high stress. When I say significant, I'm talking about 75% and higher in some classes of students who are reporting on a monthly or even daily basis that they, they are dealing with anxiety, depression, and high stress. We as a community, and I include, we are a team, we need to work together and understand what that looks like for each of the students in this school and making sure that we're supporting each of the students in this school. So in that vein, as a person who's worked with students around counseling and dealing with feelings for many years, um, I think there's a couple key points I want to bring up. First is balance. I think it's been mentioned before, but I'm going to reiterate this again. Um, as you're working with your student to think about their course selection for junior year, junior year is kind of famous for being uh, one of the most difficult years of high school. Junior year and actually first semester of senior year is pretty darn hard to, to balance everything. So I, I just want to be sure that we're thinking about students mental and physical health. Um, we're also thinking about the college application process. So second semester of junior year, students, we really ask students to start diving in and thinking about what their plan is after graduation. And that's where we're working one-on-one, -on -one. we're using the college counselor, we're, asking, we're doing seminars, and we're really having students think about the college search process and working with you at home and working with us here. Um, to do that well, uh, means that it's going to add more time onto already very full schedules for many students. So when you're thinking about supporting your child in their course selection for next year, please consider that component. Um, in some ways, I think, actually Josh just came in. Josh said it very well, and I've said it for years. Doing the college search and then application process is really like adding another course to a student's schedule if they're going to do it well. Um, because our job is to make sure that they're really researching schools and finding schools that are good matches for them, which takes time and energy. Uh, so please consider that balance piece. Um, that includes curriculum levels. So um, I just want to reiterate that you're going to go, you're going to hear from friends, you're going to hear from family members who have had students who have gone on to apply to college. There is a push on the college end where students are told you have to have APs in your schedule to come to our school. That is not true for all of the colleges out there. It is true for many of them. The reality is that we want to make sure that we're working towards having our students have the most open doors around college options as possible. But just having an AP course on their transcript does not mean that that's an automatic, OK, they've got the AP check. That means that they have a good chance at this school. If they're in APs, and they're getting C's, D's, E's, N's, or the time and energy going into that A, one or two AP classes is taking time away from doing well in other classes, or being able to do the college search process, or being able to get enough sleep, or be able to eat well, or spend some downtime taking care of themselves is really important. So I really ask you, you know your, your sophomores best. Um, you are the people who know them best. And we really, I'm pleading with you to really think about this piece of the process when you're working with your students around course selection. Um, I would say um, if, we also want students to stretch. So if a student has never taken a higher level class, whether it be AP or a higher level class, ninth and 10th grade, and they really are ready. They said, I'm ready to try this. I want to do this. Um, First of all, I would say go with a teacher recommendation 90% of the time because the teachers know your students well this year. The second piece is if your child wants to stretch and they've never kind of taken higher levels, have them stretch in one class that they really like the most or that they feel the most energized by. Having them stretch in three different directions in places where they're not terribly um, confident may be pushing them in a direction that would be adding more stress, anxiety, um, whatever to their lives. So I, I ask you to think about that possible approach um, as you work with your children at home. Um, keep in mind that counselors here, the college counselor Lenny Livingston, we are here to help students find good matches for colleges. So no matter what level of classes they're taking, the most important thing colleges will look at is a transcript. Um, so you know, spending time doing studying for APs or for um, SATs and a, um, uh, ACTs. The most important thing is grades. So please think about that. Think about the balance piece. Um, 
One last point on council recommendations. Every counselor here will write a recommendation for your child as far as their post high school plan. Many students, that means college, some it means programs, um, gap years, whatever that may be. Um, I want to dispel a rumor that exists for stu some students here and some parents that counselors can't do counseling in their office with students who need um, support because then the counselors are writing recommendations and those two things don't go together. I can guarantee you I've been doing, I've been a school counselor for almost 30 years. We are trained professionals to understand the difference between supporting students around non-school related issues or concerns they have about a friend and being able to separate that out around what is written in recommendations. So I want to re I'm going to keep saying this because I feel like it's critically important. Um, I personally, since I've come on board two and a half years ago, read every council recommendation that goes out to colleges. It's time consuming, but it's important. I can guarantee you that counselors are not writing any information in those recommendations that A, is going to be a deficit to that student as far as their applications, and B, is going to be breaking confidentiality. They're just not doing it. Um, and if they were, I would be making sure I'd hold that rack and going back, but I've never seen that happen. So I just want to really put that out there and reassure folks, if you have questions about your particular student, please reach out to their counselor. Um, if you're reaching out and needing more feedback, feel free to reach out to me. Thank you very much. Thank you. Yeah. Hi, good morning everyone. Um, my name is Josh Paris. I'm the chair of the math department here, so I'll talk about some math today. Um, all right, so going into junior year, uh, junior year is mostly about trigonometry and pre-calculus. So the kids have done geometry, they're now doing algebra two, um, very, three different levels, and then in junior year, we move on to pre-calculus. Um, so, uh, let's see what I wanna say. Um, honestly, between 10th and 11th grade is not the best of times to change levels. Um, when I came and spoke to you last year, I said, I said after 9th grade is a really good time to change levels because the curriculum from all the 9th grade courses is the same, and so the students wouldn't need to do any additional um, curriculum work to move up a level. And that's not true um, across the board in 10th grade. So in Algebra 2, the curricula diverge a little bit. So if a student does want to move up a level, they're going to have to do some additional curriculum work to prepare to do so. So um, it's not impossible, and some students do it. It's just not really ideal, I would say. Um, if your student is in Algebra 2 and they want to move up to pre-calculus honor next year, um, we will be putting, again, they're going to have to do some additional work um, to, to make up some curriculum they've missed. Um, they can do that, um, there's an option to do that in summer school, or we're gonna be, we're gonna be putting together kind of a packet or, or figuring out some chapters in a book that they can go through to prepare for that. So they can do that. Um, if you're in, if, a, if your child's in Algebra 2 honors and wants to move up to pre-calc advanced, um, they don't really need to do additional coursework, but um, it's not ideal because they've now gone through two years in the honors level and to, after that, move up to advanced, it's, it, it can work, but it's, it's a risk. The kids in advanced have gone through two years of it. They're used to the pedagogy, they're used to the pace, um, they're used to the style of teaching. So to make that move after two years um, is not ideal. And um, it's risky in that pre-calculus, as its name suggests, is a precursor to calculus. And if students have not the best experience in pre-calculus, it can lead to not the best experience in calculus um, in, in grade 12. So what I would suggest, if, if, if your child is doing well in Algebra 2 Honors, uh, Pre-Calc Honors is a great course and prepares kids to go to take uh, AP Calculus in 12th grade. So move, jumping ahead to 12th grade, um, we have two different AP Calculus courses. BC is the highest, and that's where our advanced kids go, and AB is the second highest, and that's where our, the kids in honors go. Um, if your child is in, if your student is in honors and, and is feeling like they wanna maybe get an added, added challenge, I think it's probably better to do it after 11th grade. Um, there's no, they, they, will, they won't, at that point, the curriculum um, for pre-calc honors in advance is, is, is 
matches enough for them to be able to make that jump without doing additional curriculum work. So, like Ms. Nefer said, again, we want to think about balance, but um, if your child has a really strong experience in pre-calc honors, that's a place to maybe move up for some added challenge. Um, let's see, what else? If, uh, some, of, some of your students are in IMP in 10th grade. If they're in IMP, uh, in 10th grade IMP2, then, I mean, basically, they just go on and do IMP, IMP3 in 11th grade, so it's pretty straightforward there. Uh, let's see, a couple of um, optional courses or things that kids can do. Um, we have two uh, computer programming courses that um, are taught by math teachers. They're semester long. Uh, the first one is in SNAP, which is a block-based program similar to Scratch. Uh, that's used in a lot of computer games uh, and animation programs. And then we have a, a, a comp sci course in Python, which is a, a language used, I think, more in, in, in apps, on phones, and other um, places. And really, in doing the research, we chose those two because the SNAP is, a, is for someone who has, doesn't have any experience in coding, um, using a block-based language to get started is a great idea. Um, and if you have some experience, then the research we showed, showed that, or we found, showed that Python was a great first language to, to learn. So um, your, your child can sign up for that as an additional math course if they want. The majority of kids are signing it up for it as um, career and tech ed credit, as elective credit. Um, like Mr. Kozel said, kids need three full years of electives and most kids need more electives than they need more math. Um, right now, 95% of the kids registered for the course are taking it for elective credit. But it's housed within the math department and taught by math teachers. Uh, the other option, the other thing we have um, going on is if your student is in uh, Algebra 2 Advanced, then if they're, if they're interested, they could take AP Stats in 11th grade in addition to Pre-Calculus Advanced. So Mr. Weiser talk, talked about, oh, you could sign up for AP Chem. Um, uh, Mr. Shipman talked about AP US History. In math, students can take uh, um, AP Stats, but it's only for the kids in Advanced in 10th grade because the kids in Honors um, haven't just learned enough or aren't really ready to make that move after 10th grade. Um, if your student is interested in that, they should talk to their teacher and then they actually need to come see me um, and I have a form that to fill out and, they, and you'll sign that. Um, I just like having a conversation with kids. Again, because I want to echo with what Ms. Um, Neffer said is I, I want to look at balance as well. I mean taking two Basically, advanced math courses in 11th grade is fine for some people. I don't think it's a great idea for everybody. So I kind of want to um, weigh in on whether I think it's a good idea. Um, yeah, that's what I have to say. Any questions? Yeah. So says, can you take it as a senior? Yeah. So you can. So yeah. So um, some students will um, some students will double up in. AP math in senior year, or some people will just choose AP statistics. In, I mentioned the uh, calculus courses that we have. We also have, um, some students will just take AP stats rather than the calculus course in 12th grade. So yes, uh, yeah, and then I'll, yeah. Uh, as far as I understand, the colleges want to see four years of math uh, from from high school. Uh, now, what is the options? for the fourth year for kids that don't want to take in this? Uh, we have, in 12th grade, we have a course called Foundations of Calculus. So our college prep level, kind of next year, will be the kids in Algebra 2 now, will take a course called Trigonometry and Analysis in 11th grade, and then that leads to Foundations of Calculus in 12th grade. They also, we also have a statistics course. I mean, we have AP and non-AP statistics. And we have another course called Perspectives of a Mathematical Mind, which is kind of a topics course. Um, we have another course called College Algebra Topics, which is um, kind of like a um, pre-calculus-ish for 12th graders who haven't sort of progressed that far yet. So there's lots of options for 12th graders. So I'm going to cut off Mr. Paris because we have one more speaker and we are running out of time very quickly. So if you still have questions, I would say email Mr. Paris or your student's guidance counselor. Thank you, Mr. Definitely. Paris. Yep. And Thanks. Dr. Peter Goldman is up next, our um, head of our health and wellness department. Thank you very much, Ms. Reddy. Uh, yeah, so 
I will try to be brief, but certainly want to uh, be able to promote what's happening in health and fitness. We're really excited of our program, about our program. As I'm sure you're aware, health and fitness is required each year. Uh, in high school, the course meets twice a week for 10th, 11th, and 12th graders. We have a wealth of options for students uh, to participate in our 10th, 11th, and 12th grade uh, health and fitness courses. We have yoga. We actually have 10 sections of yoga currently, and every section is completely full with um, the need to raise the lid on many of those courses to get students in that want that. We have rock climbing classes. We have beginning and intermediate swimming, personal fitness, and uh, strength training and conditioning courses. We have tennis, we have spin classes. We have what I like to say, those courses available to high school students for free that many of us pay a lot of money for in the community, right? So we want to provide students with a real world experience of lifetime physical fitness and activity. We are not a team sport type of program at the high school. Uh, again, we believe in preparing students with the knowledge, skills, attitudes, and behaviors that they can take uh, to be active throughout a lifetime. You've heard many of the coordinators speak today about the importance of balance and recognizing um, the importance of students being physically active during the school day is incredibly important uh, and how that can impact academic achievement and attendance and overall uh, mental health and well-being. I wanted to speak uh, briefly about a course that we are super excited will be offered for the first time this fall. It's called Advanced Wellness. So your students took a ninth grade uh, health and fitness course, which was essentially a health education and combination of fitness class. Uh, this course is designed, this Advanced Wellness course is designed for 11th and 12th graders only. Uh, this course came about actually at the request of our students. Uh, this is my second year in Brookline. And last year, students approached me as soon as they learned who I was. They approached me and talked about the need and the desire for additional health education for high school students. And the way it was expressed to me is that, you know, they said, they stated, we are different people as juniors and seniors than we were as ninth graders when we took the ninth grade course. And I completely understand that and I completely support their need. Uh, so, uh, I immediately began working on this and, and also <coughs> felt there was a need for additional health education. So, I sent a survey out to uh, current sophomores, juniors, and seniors to find out what health topics were most interesting to them. And of course, in alignment with our national health education standards. From there, I got the data. I formed a committee, which included Dean Reddy, uh, Rachel Iyer, parents, uh, students, of course, were on the committee, teachers, uh, we had community partners, and there was a committee of approximately 20 of us that designed a proposal for the advanced wellness course. Uh, the, the course was approved by school committee. Again, we're really excited that this course will be available to your students beginning in the spring. It will count for that junior year uh, health and fitness credit. The course will actually meet four times a week as opposed to two times, which is what the other fitness courses meet. But because this is a credit for the, man, the uh, Massachusetts mandate of uh, every year of physical education, K-12, we needed to incorporate two days of health education and two days of fitness or, or physical activity. So uh, that course will meet that mandate. Any questions for me about health and fitness? Yes, sir. How many fitness classes I usually have a credit for you this course? Why is that if the sports actually more than Great question. Uh, our health and fitness courses are actually a quarter credit, so they're 0.25. And when a student participates in a sport, they get fitness credit, health and fitness credit for that sport, but it's the same amount of credit. There's not a differentiation. Good question. Yes? If a child is on the swim team outside <coughs> of the high school, do, can they get credit for that, like if they're in swimming? Yeah, in, do in some cases, six certainly. Times? We have uh, an after-school uh, physical activity contract available for some students in, in that particular situation when they have no room in their uh, schedule to take a home fitness course uh, with blocks mm -hmm. A through G, so that is available to them. So they can, uh, they can fill out these forms because they're on the swim team on another swim team. Right, well generally if, if, there is a, uh, if they're involved in an activity of which we offer at the high school, they would not qualify for a contract. The exception is if they have no room in their schedule to take a health and fitness course, they would qualify. So they would they would want to meet with me and we'll go over the terms of the contract. Perfect. Thank you. Great question.
So what's the physical activity associated with this new course? That thank you, you, thank you. That was an incredibly important part of what I should have already shared with you. So what we wanted to do with the, with the physical fitness piece was make it a bit different for this course than what they may experience in other fitness classes. So we are referring to this type of physical activity as mindful movement, right? So it could be everything from adventure walks to, to field trips to uh, ropes courses. We would have yoga and Pilates available. So we have a wealth of offerings, but the unique piece is that the students will work with their instructor each semester to determine which of those mindful movement activities they would like to be a part of so that the teacher and the students will make that decision. So, yeah, great question. Any other questions? Thank you for your time and uh, hope you enjoy the rest of your day. Thank you. Thank you all for coming. Um, we, wow. So we have five minutes. We thought we'd have more time, but if you have any questions that I, Dean Alexander, or Dean Io, hanging out in the back, can answer for you, we can mingle for five minutes and then.